Well, great to catch up with you, Jean-Francois. Sure. Uh, we've known each other for, do you remember how long now? Oh, uh, Is it 14 years, I think. I think we met in 2004 in France at this conference on AI. Yeah. When you just sent an email out of the blue telling me we should have lunch. That's right, that's right. And here we are, we're working on very, complete, very different things. Um, sure. And the most exciting collaboration and has been on the ethics of autonomous cars and how they should be programmed. Um, and I think it's been one of the most rewarding projects for me. It's been. Uh, and we're, we're still working in this area and I think it's becoming increasingly important. Like how do we, how do we embed human ethical values or maybe superior values to, you know, in, in, uh, to humans in kinds of scenarios like an imminent accident where you need to make a decision about how do you distribute risk and, and so on. And so I just wanted to take the uh, things to the future and discuss with you as a psychologist how you, you would think about certain possible scenarios. So let's imagine you know, it's the year 2050 and there are autonomous cars all over the, the, the road uh, the majority of cars are autonomous. And then uh, all of a sudden we hear uh, more news reports about individuals who are driving regular cars, retro cars, okay. where they, they, they drive themselves and they're driving aggressively and they're kind of bullying autonomous cars, perhaps out of their lanes and so on. And uh, people are thinking, well, you know, what, what is the, the problem with these people? What, what's driving them to behave this way? As a psychologist, how would you, would you approach this problem? What would you interpret or investigate? So you mean there are self-driving cars everywhere and they drive very safely. That's and right. then there are these people who actually uh, suddenly revert to driving themselves and, and behave like antisocial drivers against the self-driving cars? That's yeah. right. So yeah, like okay. bringing something that hasn't been seen you know, for a long time, perhaps. Yeah, okay. So I think first I would bet good money that most of these people are men. Right? <laughs> And then, well, okay, I think, you know, there are people who say that uh, human culture has been a long process of self-domestication, mm -hmm. that we've been taming ourselves, you know, like turning also, also from wolves to dogs. Mm -hmm. And uh, I suppose that at every point in this process, there's always been people saying, no, I'm a wolf. You know, I don't want this, you know, tame society. I'm a warrior, you know. And I suppose that this is going to happen at every stage. And in this case, I suppose the new thing is that uh, we're going to be tamed by the machines, right? By the cars. Mm -hmm. Then suddenly the cars are going to take away the driving from us and tame it into something that's smooth and safe for everyone. So I would guess, yes, that some people would react against that, not only because they don't want to be tamed, but also because they don't want to be tamed by machines. Well, that's, that, okay, that's an interesting uh, way to look at the problem. I guess, you know, there are perhaps some mm. uh, parallels today. You know, for instance, you know, we no longer have to go and hunt our own food. Well, most people don't, uh, but some people do. And do you think that, uh, you know, people who are interested in, in hunting or people who are interested in just kind of, uh, you know, maybe martial arts and, and so on are kind of craving this sort of primitive uh, drive for physical dominance or control of, of some something or some some animal or some uh, uh, someone. It's funny that all your examples involve violence. They do. <laughs> yeah. I mean, because I'm trying to drive this because we're talking about aggressive killing, driving behavior, <laughs> killing stuff, punching people. <laughs> right. That's yeah. right. So, do you think it's, it comes from the same? These examples come from the same place, or do you think that you know from this kind of nostalgia for? you know, a different world that we as humans have evolved to cope with. Uh, but now the world is, is more tame and, and, and therefore it is not necessary for us to, uh, to exercise this level of, right. uh, of control or violence or whatever. Well, I think it's a continuous process, right? I think it started way, way ago that we started not to bash people head on rocks you know, all the time and started maybe to cooperate with them, uh, build small groups, then larger groups. So maybe it's accelerated, I don't know, in, in recent history, but it started a long while ago. And, uh, and yes, I suppose that 
uh, every, uh, in every age of humanity, some people reacted against this uh, decline of violence mm -hmm. or this increase in cooperation. But again, I think that uh, in the past, you would react against uh, other people telling you you should not be violent, for example, mm -hmm. or other people trying to limit your uh, aggressivity. But now we're thinking about robots doing that, robot chiding us. Which could be kind of fundamentally different. So I wanted to uh, kind of go into a different uh, body of research that you've uh, been working on and your, your new book, uh, which is, you know, can, can you share the title with us? Uh, Reasoning Unbound. Reasoning Unbound, that's right. And, and I, I guess in the book, you know, this, you, you've done a lot of research on the psychology of reasoning and how people, how people reason, what sort of reasoning errors they make, you know, in, in a similar fashion to the judgment and decision-making literature, but more about, about inference and reasoning. And I guess the overarching sort of story of that is that reasoning is really a solution to the uh, cooperation problem, mm -hmm. in a sense, right? So we, we reason because we, we can figure out ways to cooperate, you know, where we have win-win solutions, or maybe we can convince one another right. uh, that the, you know, a certain course of action is mutually beneficial and, and so on. So now that we have these kind of new, uh, new agents in the world, um, you know, this is, I would say that AIs are the, f the first tool that we build that has agency of its own. You know, all tools mm. in the past have been uh, subject to our own agency. Mm -hmm. They may amplify our agency and our ability to change the world, but this is the first time where we build a tool that decides on its own how to do, how to take actions and, and you know, optimize certain objectives that we give it. Mm. So, so how do you, do you think that these machines would then, um, th then they're capable of making decisions that impact others, and mm -hmm. these could be cooperative decisions mm -hmm. or non-cooperative decisions, just like, you know, let's say, you know, if we use the autonomous car example, two cars at an intersection, somehow there are norms around, you know, when do you do go, who goes first, you know, mm -hmm. whoever came first goes first, or maybe there's some sort of signaling taking place, but perhaps there are other examples about, about um, algorithms or machines and people having to uh, also cooperate or figure out, you know, uh, coordinates in some ways mm. to mutual benefit. Do you think uh, that the same kinds of mechanisms will have to be recognized and utilized by the machines? Or do you think new kinds of mechanisms, you know, are we going to have to learn new languages mm. for cooperating with the machines? Yeah, uh, yeah, I guess we're going to be terrible at that. Well, yes and no. So first, it's true that uh, we're super good at figuring out people because that's a very useful skill in the human species. You, you really want to figure out what makes other people tick. You know, can you trust them? What can you offer them? Are they going to be, stay true to their word? Uh, but that's limited to humans. So by the way, that means that the people who are going to study machine behavior are going to be much more credible than the psychologists who study humans. And I'm saying that because I'm a psychologist, you know, and which means that uh, everyone is sort of a psychologist. You know, uh, so when you say you're a psychologist, people think you're nothing special because they're pretty good at understanding people. Mm -hmm. and, and I think they're right, by the way, that, that being a psychologist is just being slightly better at something that your whole species has been optimized to do, you know, by hundreds of thousands of year evolution. But that's for understanding people. Understanding machines is going to be an entirely different field, entirely different rules, right? And, and do you think that the, the, it is the computer scientists who are better equipped uh, to study that, th those machines, or is it going to also be the psychologists in this case, or both? Well, if the machine is going to interact with humans, we are going to need a, a, a lot more people than computer scientists, yes. And psychologists will have something to do here. I think mostly because uh, okay, we're super good at figuring out people, at understanding people, and we tend to use these skills, I guess, uh, to explain the behavior of many other things than humans, like animals. Like people tend to treat their dogs as if they were humans, you know, to read the intent in the dog. People, I mean, some people probably uh, read the clouds as having agency. No. That's right, but we've had, I guess we've had so many, you know, 
thousands, maybe millions of years of exposure to other agents which are you know, not from our own species, as well as uh, uh, natural forces like the clouds that can be uh, perceived as agents. Mm. But, the, but machines are in, in, in a whole new category of agent altogether. Yeah, but in that case, okay, so if I want to understand, I don't know, uh, dolphin, you know, uh, I'm going to project my understanding of people and what the dolphin does. Do you know that story about uh, the dolphin that helped people who drone to get back to the beach? There are many, many stories about that. The dolphins are, when they see someone droning, mm -hmm. actually nudge that person back to the beach. Wow. The problem is, no, it's survivor bias because you don't hear about the, the dolphin, the people that the dolphin pushed away <laughs> from the beach, right? <laughs> But it's uh, but but then you see so probably dolphins are actually killing as many people as they save because they just randomly push them they, in one direction. Oh right? wow! Okay. But but yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Don't quote me on this. Yes. <laughs> but but you see what I mean. But but it's so seductive this story about dolphin actually helping people mm -hmm. to to get back to the beach so that that we we give them this agency and this moral virtue, this desire to help, and in that case it leads us uh, astray. Mm -hmm. Right? But in the case of machines, actually, people program the machines. Even if the machines learn and change on the way, uh, at some point, uh, humans actually put some behavior into it or put some guiding principle into it. So in that case, I suppose that projecting or understanding of people on the machine is going to be less dangerous or less prone to mistakes than when we do that for you know, fishes. Or insects. Okay, but, but but I guess that that depends on who's doing the evaluation. So so let's say you know the the the, the normal mm. layperson who is not a scientist uh, is going to use their kind of folk psychology. Mm -hmm. You know they do use their folk psychology to think about dolphins, but also uh, perhaps about machines and and perhaps there are cultural differences in how you you know whether you perceive the machines are fundamentally evil or fundamentally good and so on. Um, but and and then you have the kind of the professional uh, scientist who's you know either a, a computer scientist or a behavioral scientist who's perceiving you know these uh, the, the machines. Do you think that the lay pe the lay persons would be um, more or less prone to uh, bringing their kind of folk psychology to thinking about the machines? Do you think they're going to do it just as much as they do it with um, dolphins, more or less, or does it depend on the domain? Yeah, I think it's going to be very hard not to do it. All right. Of course, uh, dolphins have eyes and, and moves, and they have some characteristics that make it easier to, to give them uh, the, the, the kind of thoughts and motivations that we grant to people. Uh, for machines, probably going to be uh, harder if you just interact with a screen, basically. <laughs> And text, but uh, yeah, if it's but, not a humanoid robot or a physical, you know, robotic dog or something, it's probably just an algorithm that is, right. you know, chatting with you or setting some prices of goods and stuff. I think it's going to be incredibly difficult for people not to actually treat these things as having some kind of human psychology. Yeah. Okay, and and do, so do you think that uh, then in this case the the, the scientist has a better chance of uh, actually being substantially better? Uh, right. Then the you know unlike the case of uh, human folk psychology versus right. human professional psychology. Yeah, because I suppose that behavioral. I mean, part of the training mm -hmm. of a behavioral scientist is to realize how much you're wrong, yep. you know, about people and how much you don't know about what makes them tick, and that your limited experience with your own mental universe is uh, really, really insufficient <laughs> to understand uh, what goes on in the mind of other people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I suppose that behavioral scientists at least will have this kind of training in uh, refraining from reading too much into the behavior of another agent. Okay, so, so it, it kind of brings me back, I guess with, with this study, maybe it's, maybe it's getting a little, uh, it might get a little too abstract, but so, so we should ground it. But do you think that, um, you know, behavior is behavior, you know, and it's, you know, even if there's a machine now exhibiting this behavior, it's still situated in the world, uh, therefore it has to be behavior about things in the world right and 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 therefore it's not going to be fundamentally different like you know i would say that maybe you know the way that a, a corporation behaves you know a corporation is kind of a machine you know of flesh and blood that's what uh, mm -hmm. norbert weiner i think has has described uh, corporations as and 
in the sense that you know they have their own, they have a sense of agency. You know, corporation makes a decision or a corporation moves into a market. Mm -hmm. You know, there are things that a corporation does, uh, and somehow uh, we can ascribe you know uh, you know mental states and, and intentionality to these to a corporation uh, because even though it's a complex body of people with rules and bureaucracies and so on. But somehow, because it's situated in the world, it can only do the same kinds of things that people do, just maybe at a different scale. So mm. it can buy things, it can move, it can open a headquarter somewhere else, and, and uh, which, is, which is similar to a human being moving from one place to another. Mm. Um, so do you think that, uh, that there's, this, this would enable us somehow to continue to project more of our folk psychology onto machines as well? Or do you think that a machine could exhibit completely alien Kind of behavior, you know. Like an, a recent example was the uh, the game of Go, uh, you mm. know, with DeepMind, uh, and they called it. Um, I think some of the moves that uh, the the algorithm AlphaGo made against one of the world uh, champions uh, was described as alien play. Mm -hmm. That is a play that is unseen, you know, before, right. but uh, but now is obviously recognized. So, do you think this is this is just a fluke or kind of a, a weird uh, sort of very peculiar thing in a because Go is a very peculiar game, or do you think um, it has this, this truth to this, you know, kind of alien behavior? But, but in other case, when people call that an alien move or something, that as you said, because uh, they have never seen something like that. But I don't think it led people to question, for example, the motivation of AlphaGo. Right? They mm -hmm. still believe that it was trying to win. It was trying to win in a very uh, different way and in an unseen way. But they did not suddenly say, oh, we think that this machine has suddenly changed its goals. And by playing this movie, it's trying, I don't know, to make us laugh. Or, mm -hmm. <laughs> no. So, so uh, the action may be very unexpected, but we still, you know, understanding in the framework, in the general framework of goal-directed behavior. Mm -hmm. you know, we, we, we sort of understand the goal of this agent and we... Uh, assign a form of rationality to it, the agent that it's doing what it thinks is best to achieve its goals, right? Yes. But we're not suddenly changing this whole framework just because one behavior wasn't expected. So we, you know, we, we live in a world where there are other humans and, and animals and, and uh, natural forces that we mm. ascribe intentionality to, and we've been doing this for so long that we have this kind of folk psychology around. And then the question is, which means you know, the scientists, the psychologists, and the laypersons are fairly close. You know, the, the laypersons are very good at, uh, at human psychology too. Now, with machines, uh, they could be, um, a layperson may fall behind because they don't understand how the machines operate. Right. But they do still, they can still ascribe intentionality because ultimately the machines will be in the world doing things that that agents in the world do, unless they, unless they are attempting, you know, to to work on goals that are beyond our comprehension. Okay, okay. So, so I think where people can do really bad mistakes is uh, in cases where the machine actually fails mm -hmm. to do what's rational. Mm -hmm. That is, that if that people can understand an expected behavior from a machine as a different way to achieve its goal, as something they would not have thought of. But it's going probably to be very hard to realize when a machine does something that's really, really a bad idea or a failure of programming. Mm -hmm. And that people will continue to think that this erratic behavior of the machine is, well, a creative solution mm -hmm. to some kind of problem. You know, I do think that if you see a robot you know, doing something that looks, uh, that is unusual and that doesn't look like a good idea, you're going to suspend your judgment for a long while before you know coming to the conclusion that the robot has gone crazy. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So I guess I guess what you're what you're describing here is that we need to recognize that you know machines, just like humans, will have uh, psychological pathologies. Uh, Machine may fail in spectacular way, and we might be less you know less precise in our assessment of their pathology. Yes. Uh -huh. That we may ascribe, you know, we may see some pathologies as uh, features or, or some s somewhat, you know, creative approaches. Alien approaches, but which are ultimately goal-directed, right? I see. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, I guess this will be this. You know, I, I guess getting this right. You know, what do you think would, it would it would require for us to get this right? Is it a better understanding? You know, is it the computer scientists giving us a better understanding of the mechanics so that they can you know open the hood so to speak and then figure out what's happening and see you know the equivalent of a short circuit uh, or something like that, or or you know or a blown up fuse. Uh, or is it going to be a change in the way that we uh, characterize the behavior of the machine observationally? Yeah, I think this is one case where, uh, in fact, even better than having a, a psychologist looking at the machine, you, it's one of the cases where you probably need such people studying animal behavior in very strange realms you know, mm -hmm. uh, of the animal kingdom. You know, people who are used to suspend any kind of assumption about the organism that we're looking at and, you know, having this very open-minded way to try to understand what, what the organism is doing. Is that efficient? Is that an anomaly? Is that a misadaptation? And, mm -hmm. and then apply this kind of very open-minded to, uh, approach to, to what machines are doing. I see. So I'm trying. I'm trying to kind of find like a concrete example of of what what this might look like in the case of a machine. Like let's say you know. But you see, that's the problem. Yeah. The, the problem is that we we're going to be so bad at at, at creating these examples that mm -hmm. we're going to be very bad at recognizing them because precisely, it's very hard for us to imagine uh, the creative way in which a machine can go uh, pathological. That's right. Yeah. It, it actually reminds me of a. Like the talk that uh, one of the Sertaj Karaman, who was a faculty here at MIT, who builds self-driving cars, uh, was giving, which is when he participated in the one of the early DARPA Grand mm -hmm. Challenges, mm -hmm. which you know from which the uh, self-driving car technology was born. Um, so he was part of the MIT team, and there was a, a team from another university, I believe it was Cornell, and uh, the MIT car was trying to go uh, around the corner and this this vehicle from Cornell was stuck and that it seems you know and, and, and in this case it was the case of a mach of the MIT car not understanding you know what the Cornell car was doing mm -hmm. and the Cornell car was, just happened to think that it there was a, an, a rock literally underneath it was some, something wrong with with this perception system and therefore all moves all in all directions mm -hmm. are not going to work so mm -hmm. it was kind of like self uh, immobilized, uh, but the the vehicle, the MIT vehicle, was not able to mi to read the mind of the Cornell right. vehicle. So this is, I guess, a situation where you know the car was not adapted to a particular situation, mm -hmm. and uh, that led to actually a collision between the two. So and and they, this is something that they did not foresee whatsoever. Right. So I'm I'm, I'm guessing that there could be uh, others, but but as you said, I'm find, I'm finding it very hard to imagine. Mm. Um, a situation like that. I guess, you know, people who study um, financial uh, trading, you know, uh, algorithmic trading mm -hmm. have, have also, you know, been puzzled by, for example, the some, some emergent behavior like, mm -hmm. you know, a bunch of algorithms that are, you know, following simple rules for buying and selling and all of a sudden there's a market collapse, mm -hmm. you know, and there's a flash crash uh, because the, the, the algorithms somehow start responding to one right. another. In, in ways that produce a kind of global catastrophe. And it's something that we humans do too, right? Uh, we, we sometimes, we heard, you know, out of the market, we have bank runs and so on. So, but maybe they do, the, the machines will do that in different ways that we cannot anticipate. Exactly, exactly. And, 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 and sometimes we will not have the outcome you know, uh, right away. You mm -hmm. know, when the outcome is immediate, that when, the, when the car is stuck and does not move or when the stocks are going down, you know, we know something bad has just happened, but but seeing that the machine is doing something that is only a little bit strange, but that is ultimately going to 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 to, to trigger a catastrophe, that that's going to be quite a challenge, right? Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's let's switch gears to another uh, question, which is, you know, you've recently done. Uh, research on something that you call the ostrich bias. So can you, oh, yeah. can you describe that to me? The ostrich bias, yes. So uh, you know, I've got this uh, grim interest into what it does to your mind when you think about your future death. Which, uh, and by the way, what, one thing that it does to your mind is that right at this moment when I'm you know, 
uh, mentioning this possibility, this future event, not this possibility, by the way, mm -hmm. this future event to you, uh, your, all your cognitive resources are suddenly mobilized not to think about it. So you're probably not going to have a clever retort <laughs> to that for the next four minutes. But yeah, so it does weird thing to you when you think about your future death, uh -huh. mostly because you don't want to think about it. Yep. And so you, uh, so you're, uh, you mobilize all sorts of cognitive resources that are no longer available to do other things. And mm -hmm. one of the other things that we were interested in in this paper is uh, actually uh, simulating the future. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, so of course that's called something that's called uh, perspective memory sometimes, or well, actually time travel, mental tra time travel. So you can imagine things that uh, happened in the past. You can imagine things that happened to your future. And when you generate this, uh, this, the scenes in your head, you have a different level of detail. Mm -hmm. Right. So what we showed is that when you ask people to think about their death, uh, and then you ask them to simulate an event of their past. Uh, they can simulate it all right with same level of detail that if they had not think about death. But if you ask them to think, to simulate an event in the future, certainly the scene they have in their mind is much less detailed. You know, it has a coarse grain. As if, you know, they, they did not have the, uh, the, the, the cognitive resources necessary to actually simulate a detailed version of the future because they were thinking about their death. And that, this is what we call the ostrich bias. That suddenly you plunge your head in the sand, you know, and you're no longer able to look at the future. And, and, and why do you think it only applies to the future? You know, that, that thinking about the death does not make thinking about the past less, uh, less vivid? Presumably because, it, because the, the, the mental mechanisms that you use to simulate the past and the future are uh, not exactly the same. Right? And that, uh, not to be too technical, right? Yeah. But that the, 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 this uh, thinking about death uh, uh, impairs some specific mechanism that you use to simulate the future. Okay, yeah. okay that's, that's really interesting. And do, but do, do you think that um, we're less um, able to simulate details in the future, even if we have not explicitly been reminded of our impending no, death? If you're not reminded of the death, you know, you can simulate details in the future all right. Okay. Right. It's specific and, uh, and it's really specific to thinking about your death because we tried doing that with the death of your favorite celebrity, for example, and that doesn't impair uh, the, 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 the details of your future simulation. In, in one time, in, in something that I did not publish, that I did with uh, uh, Bastien Tremolière, a former student of mine, we actually also asked to, uh, people to think of a time in the past where they did not exist. Mm -hmm. Because there's been a long period of time where you and I did not exist, right? And if people think about that time, it does nothing. Mm -hmm. you know, it, it, it's not scary. That's right. And it does not affect their cognitive resources. So non-existence is not the problem, right? Because, because you can think of a time where, when you mm -hmm. did not exist without impairment. But thinking of non-existence in the future and uh, is a little bit scarier, but what is really scary is the transition mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that awaits in the future from existent to non-existent. So, so this makes me think about like the, the way that a lot of, you know, AI futures are portrayed in the, in the media or in, you know, uh, Hollywood. Mm -hmm. That th there's a lot of, uh, you know, machines taking over the world or machines kind of going after humans and killing them. And, uh, you know, obviously this would lead to our death. You know, our, this would this would challenge our our own existence. And do you think that this um, do you think that this kind of ostrich bias could also shape the way that we think about a post-human future or or a, a, a future in which machines kind of are 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 a threat to ourselves? To be honest, I don't think so because uh, because I think most of us realize that this future is one where we will have ceased to exist before, right? Okay, so it's too that far from this, the transition point. Yeah, this is not going to happen in your lifetime, so it's not scary. You know? But, but you know, but the, what, what the, you know, new videos from like different companies, uh, you know, that are building very powerful, very kind of scary uh, humanoid robotics um, are making this, a little, this possibility a little bit more present in our minds. Do you think that 
that, that then these kind of mechanisms would be activated or deactivated? Yeah, I can see you really want it to work, but <laughs> my professional opinion is that okay. no. <laughs> Great. Well, okay, so I want, let, let's move to another uh, topic, which is um, um, <clears throat> kind of related to the question of, um, you know, how our own reasoning uh, depends on uh, or, or is our own reasoning faculties are very much or in large part in service of our cooperation with others, mm -hmm. you know, being able to predict what others will do mm -hmm. so that we can uh, cooperate with them or being able to persuade them and so on. Um, now there is, uh, you know, and social media and the internet somewhat, you know, enables uh, us to scale a lot of these things. You know, we, we can mm -hmm. talk to lots of other people, mm -hmm. perhaps who have different opinions. We can argue with them. We can, we can try and push them to do our bidding or to join our cause and so on. Um, but, you know, I, I'm always thinking about the, uh, the possibility of AI agents be, becoming a player in this, in this space. Okay. And there's this kind of idea that, um, um, you know, today there are, there are individuals who have kind of crusades online for certain causes and there are, you know, these people can be on the right or on the left and they, they have different sort of objectives, uh, but they, they perceive themselves as moral agents who want to improve the world or mm -hmm. who want to kind of spread a, a message, mm -hmm. um, you know, very much in the same, in the same uh, vein. Now, uh, what happens when... Uh, this becomes, it becomes possible to automate some of these activities. So let's say, you know, that you start, um, instead of me kind of finding out if somebody, you know, if, if a friend or somebody in my, in my social circle said something racist, then I would call them out. But suppose you're able to write a, you know, a program that is a uh, moralistic agent, like an autonomous moralistic mm. weapon that I can point uh, you know, at certain individuals or organizations, or even maybe just kind of let into the wild. Mm -hmm. uh, so, do you think? Uh, how, how do you think it would play out uh, if something like this uh, uh, were to become a possibility, which I think is technically feasible fairly soon? So let me get this right. So you, uh, so instead of identifying yourself, uh, say injustice and trying to uh, call people out mm -hmm. on their behavior, you just program a bot to do that for you mm -hmm. and to go and call out people on what they do. Of course, the bot is going to identify a lot more, uh, a lot more situations that you yourself would have been able to That's identify. Right. So probably you don't want to hear about every time the bot finds out about something because you would spend your day deluged in, in right. alerts from the bots that said, oh, this person uh, you know, had this behavior and that other person had this objectionable tweet and that other person posted an offensive video. And, right? so, I think, so in the end, you would not even want to know. That's right, which is, I, mean, I guess, to use, you know, it, it, since, since I'm, I'm calling it a weapon, you know, we can talk about conventional weapons. You know, in the old days, you, know, people, you used to have to kill a person yourself with, with, a, mm -hmm. with, a, with a stone or with a knife. And then all of a sudden you can throw, you know, you can okay. throw a cannonball uh, or, or, or uh, a charge or, or a missile. And then you don't really know the details, but you know that it's causing much more harm. Mm. So, so you're not yourself being emotionally engaged, for example, yep. with calling out this other person because you've just automated uh, the process of mm -hmm. finding out about them and, 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 well, yeah, and calling them out. Okay. Yeah, it's funny. It reminds me of a question I asked on Twitter in a Twitter poll recently, mm -hmm. where I said, imagine there is a drug that keeps your moral uh, capacity to distinguish right and wrong or fair and unfair intact, but that suppresses your uh, capacity to feel moral outrage. Mm -hmm. So you don't have any kind of emotion. You see that someone is doing something uh, right or wrong, or you see that someone is fair or unfair, but you don't have any kind of emotional response to that. And uh, a majority of people said they would uh, never take this drug because they value the emotional engagement, you know, the emotional okay. component of finding out about injustice mm -hmm. and, and calling it out. You know, yeah. they, they, so it's not, jo it's not just a utilitarian thing you know, of identifying injustice, mm -hmm. doing something about it, 
but there's also something that people value about the emotional response they have in that process. So in, in this case, I think that uh, the same people would say, who, who say, I would not take a drug that suppresses mm -hmm. my moral outrage, the same people would hate the idea of actually delegating uh, the job of finding out about injustice to, to, to a bot and, 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 and therefore suppressing any kind of emotional engagement they have. But, but surely there is a trade-off, right? But there's a trade-off between, I, I, I get the point, and, and, and I think you know, perhaps there is a kind of a gratification in, in uh, you know, having that moral outrage and then, and then being able to quench it with, you know, by calling somebody out. But then, uh, but there should be, uh, surely is a trade-off between uh, that and, and effectiveness, you know, at actually uh, calling people sure. out or, you know, furthering the cause that, you know, whatever cause this person is interested in, in the same way that, you know, perhaps if you, you know, in a, in a, in a very charged, you know, uh, armed conflict, you know, surely it's more uh, emotionally charging to kill every person, you know, yourself, but people still want to use, you know, uh, guns and kind of kill them from afar to, to minimize risk, perhaps, right. of, of retaliation and, and all sorts of other things. And just to be more effective. Well, you're talking about a situation where presumably these people would prefer to avoid the situation entirely. I mean, presumably these people would prefer not to presumably. be in this situation yeah, yes. entirely, right? right. And, uh, but if we're thinking about people who actually chose to be in that situation, mm -hmm. you know, I would not be surprised if this person preferred the uh, personal way but it could to be, inflict it, damage. But, on, yeah. on the other hand, uh, I mean, people do want to minimize retaliation. Mm -hmm. right? So, for instance, you know, a lot of people have uh, some alias online so that they mm -hmm. can, you know, they can make their... their uh, statements and pronouncements and comments on 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 blogs and, and discussion forums. Um, so that could be another possibility that you don't want to you don't want to engage directly with your own identity because mm. you're trying to pro to prevent uh, retaliatory attacks right. on your own character. Look, so I guess that if really there were something like uh, as you say uh, this moral weapon, mm -hmm. this bot that would be able to detect any any objectionable phrasing or any objectionable thing that you said, I suppose we would see the arm race, right? That mm -hmm. people would use uh, bots that check whatever they uh, say or do mm -hmm. and in order to, to, to tweak it a little bit, right? In order to make them invisible <laughs> to these other bots which are uh, seeking uh, okay, to, that's, to so that's them out, right? Okay, that's a good point. So, so that's an interesting possibility. So you think, you know, before you tweet, there's kind of a... Um, a filter right. that that will will would allow a person to basically pre prevent uh, detection exactly. somehow by by these kind of autonomous moral moralistic weapons. And uh, would you not, would you not like something like like an Insta Instagram filter for email? Yes, where you, you, you just type what you want to say, and then the bot just adds niceties before and, I, and after. I think <laughs> I, I think these technologies uh, are already kind of getting into the market. Well, I, I I've, I've heard stories about that. Yeah. I'm I'm just it, it sounds like vaporware to me, but but you know at yeah. least the idea is out there, yeah. and I I, yeah. I imagine you know it's just a matter of time before it becomes. Uh, uh, By the way, I would love that. I mean, I mean, how many of us are actually using can response already? Right. That's so right. you're yeah. using your email and then you have four or five possible responses and they're usually much more nice than what I would say myself, you know. Yes. There's a lot of thank you exclamation points. So I use them, you know. I think, oh, that makes me look nice. That's right. That's right. So, um, so but, but I guess, you know, so you said when you mentioned the arms race, uh, the, uh, the arms race in terms of, you know, this autonomous moralistic weapon that's calling people out mm -hmm. when they say something that could be you know, misconstrued or mm -hmm. interpreted and so on. And then the, the def, you know, this is what you described was kind of a defensive weapon, mm -hmm. you know, which is something that prevents you from being detected. Mm -hmm. Maybe there are other things that would happen as well, like um, like a change in the language. So there could be mm -hmm. a constant shift in the, the language and, and the symbols that you use to express certain ideas. Right. You know, just like spam. Uh, there's a, fi you know, mm -hmm. there's a constant battle between the spam, mm -hmm. uh, spammers and the spam filters. Um, in that the spammers continue right. to find other more sophisticated ways that are you know beyond the, the reach of, of current spam filtering but, technology. But, but, sorry, but what would be the equivalent saying racist things under the radar? Yeah, that <laughs> like kind of, finding like, new slurs every day. 
Well, people invent all kinds of terms all the time, right? right. To, to to describe to demean one another, and, mm. and I, I don't, you know, I don't think there's a reason why this would stop. Maybe, right. but but it could be accelerated. But then then there could be, you know, in this arms race, it could be, you know, different groups using the same kinds of, you know, autonomous moralistic weapon mm. uh, against each other, right? So that's you know, so so kind of offensive weapons against against one another. Mm. And and I just wonder if, like, do you think in this case we would just descend into a chaotic? You know, world in which no no communication is you know public communication. Uh, let's say the, the public square becomes so you know the, the virtual or the cyber public square is so full of noise you know generated by by algorithms talking to each other and kind of yelling at each other that w- there's no rule for us to no, no role for us left to actually be part of this conversation. And, and I feel like we're already sort of retreating a little bit to private conversations more. Uh, because it's you know being online and, and being so public is so um, so unpredictable, right? So we would essentially leave that electronic space to bots and and move somewhere else. I think that probably happened right with animal species, like we we introduce a new animal species in an environment without realizing that no the species is going to invade this environment, mm-hmm. and after that we just say okay let's move elsewhere. Let leave that island to the rabbits. <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, it's it's happened in one island where I, that in which I lived. It's right. called Australia. Yeah. But but the, the humans did not leave. But I think That's they right. they kept bringing more and more species. And this is maybe, mm. maybe maybe this is another possible dynamic that you know you bring in you first bring you know uh, one species to kill a certain uh, mm-hmm. you know pest, and then that that species b- becomes a pest itself, right. and then you have to bring the its own predator. Um, and then you, you just multiply the problem. Right. But in that case, that's because you can't really leave, right? I mean, it's going to be hard to leave everything. But if it's an electronic space, if it's a social media platform, mm-hmm. you know, leaving is not as costly. That's right. Unless, you know, unless that kind of platform becomes just somehow self-sustaining that, that uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, you could leave. You could, you could use other apps or other platforms. And other and platforms are going to rush into the market to provide you a bot-free experience or... You know, uh, a free speech space where you know uh, bots are systematically detected and killed. Mm-hmm. I suppose I could see that coming. Yeah. Okay. I, yeah. I guess. I guess then. Then uh, kind of one way that this this process could end up is you, you know you literally go back to the old you know this this promise of like social media being so open and you being able to talk to anyone across the world that you don't know who has different mm-hmm. ideas. Is basically that dream would be dead. I mean, it's kind of some people are are you know saying that it's already dying, uh, that that social media did not and, and the internet did not deliver on its promise mm-hmm. of creating this kind of um, very open world in which ideas flow you know more freely. That it's actually led to more polarization rather than mm-hmm. less polarization of opinion, whether it's political or social. And, you, you, and you, you, excuse me, but do you remember the word before the internet? You do, right? Yes, yes. Don't you think? It's been a huge progress. I mean, don't you think that ideas do flow more freely? I mean, I, I do. I, I I'm do buying agree. the polarizing thing any day, you know. For so you're not buying the the the, the notion that there is more polarization. No, no. I mean, I, I'm I'm happy with the polarizing thing mm-hmm. any day, you know, because I do remember what life was in a small city before the internet, and yeah, I think the benefits so uh, the benefits we got. From that, mm-hmm. the exposure to the to the ideas of the rest of the world, you know, has been so huge that perhaps people have even greater expectations. Mm-hmm. But uh, I would never go back. Okay, so you would say, okay, so so I guess another way of characterizing what you said is that maybe there was an over excessive promise, uh, you know, that we expected the internet not just to give us access to more information at our fingertips and ability to navigate and mm-hmm. and you know. Uh, aggregate opinions about you know good restaurants and you know all the conveniences that we have. We thought it would also solve you know bring about world peace, and that would yeah, maybe a little too much. Right? Yeah, and it's not just about aggregating; it's also finding people like you. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, maybe you know, the, the great thing about social media, I think, and and, and the internet is that, uh, however uh, unique you thought you were, mm-hmm. uh, you're going to find many many people. You're going to find your community somewhere. Right. So, so okay. So, speaking of finding communities, uh, you know, the, the, we're now using the technology to find to find other people like us. Right. And sometimes these are friends. Sometimes they're romantic partners. 
and right. and there's a question of you know then um, uh, you know the, there's there's lots of companies working on technologies that create romantic companions that are uh, machines you know no. like uh, sex okay. robots and whatnot and then uh, so do you think that as this technology becomes more and more sophisticated and more you know these these pleasure robots become more and more realistic looking do you think that this would somehow fundamentally alter human relationships or is it just a you know another uh, it's just something similar to, to to something we're familiar with already. Wait, wait, so, so you switch from romantic partner to pleasure bot <laughs> <laughs> not exactly the same thing but <laughs> thank you for clarifying the difference yeah okay. I, I imagine there would, there would be a, a market for both I imagine yeah right no because okay because sex bots I mean I mean we've always had sexual experiences that did not involve other humans right that's not new I'm not talking about bestiality here okay yet. <laughs> please clarify <laughs> no I'm talking about watching porn you know, some people watch porn some people use sex toys some people I hear like to read you know how Lord of the Ring inspired erotica okay I'm interesting I did not know that you did not okay so uh, so yeah no so people have had uh, these sexual experiences not involving other humans right mm -hmm. involving artifacts you know uh, maybe movies uh, erotic novels mm -hmm. sex toys and we've never felt that this was uh, you know fundamental transformation of sexuality okay so sex bot in a sense are just the continuation of this trend so in that case I suppose we don't really change things fundamentally but if we're talking about romantic partners then yes I suppose that here the change is massive because I mean I mean if we're honest when we talk about life partners or romantic partners we're thinking about babies right mm -hmm. we're thinking about probably okay being in long-term relationships and for many many people being in long-term relationships means you know having children yep so in that case, uh, if if we if we know not talking about sex bots but parent bots or something like that, then yeah, that's very different, right? So what would a parent bot be like? So I guess you could have this babysitter bot, which is the you know the not very exciting option, the mm -hmm. nanny bot. So you're not really co-parenting. <laughs> You know, you have a bot that, to which you delegate some of the parenting tasks. Mm -hmm. And the crazy option, crazy option would be uh, to actually have a child with, uh, with, with genes correspond to the phenotype of your uh, robot partner. So you pick a robot partner with a certain phenotype, mm -hmm. and then uh, a company offers you sex cells that you can mix with your own. Mm -hmm. sex cells which actually correspond to the phenotype of your robot partner mm -hmm. and then you can actually really in a sense have a baby with a robot and that I think would be a much much deeper transformation of society than just uh, well shagging with a bot it sounds like a Rick and Morty sort of uh, episode <laughs> to me um, for, well, for sure but but I guess I guess you know we can imagine like a combination of robotics and uh, genetic engineering technologies reaching a level where this may actually be feasible it doesn't it doesn't sound in, like an entirely crazy idea to me and here can you imagine I mean how we would change everything because people can have sex with objects and we don't feel that we're in competition with the objects Right. Mm -hmm. I don't feel in competition with erotic novels or sex toys. But uh, but if no, we're in competition with bots to actually procreate, mm -hmm. that's a turning point in the history of the species. I agree because I think uh, and I think there's also another another open question, I guess, that you know I find even a hard time kind of wrapping my head around is which is that what sort of evolutionary processes would would take place on you know in this situation right we we sort of understand you know a fair bit about the way that sexual selection takes place in in humans and in animals 
um, in kind of organic life, but mm. you know, what sort of uh, selection pro processes would take place, you know, when you can sort of arbitrarily create copies of uh, DNA and combine them with other arbitrary uh, DNA and, you know, and, and then, you know, what, would the market sort of drive this kind of selection with, with uh, you know, everybody want the same model, uh, so to speak? Um, or, or will there be, you know, sufficient diversity as even, I mean, this, this is getting really science fiction here. But yeah, and then, yeah, and neither of us is of us quite is. a specialist of sexual selection. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, so I think on, on that note, maybe we should kind of wrap up because right. we're, I think we're reaching the, you know, what's that, the, the Peter Principle, the, the, the limit <laughs> of our, you know, the, <laughs> we're reaching the limit of our incompetence. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's been a lot of fun yet. Yes, likewise. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank and you. Uh, we'll continue hopefully working together for many years to come. I still hope so. Yes. <laughs>